teaching is important, but if the classroom is the only place that many students spend on campus, your responsibility is so much more. And that's why a lot of my work is focused on the classroom as communities. Welcome everyone to another Learning Labs speaker series. I, I welcome he you here uh, in a space where we say that ideas come to play free of boundaries or walls or status or title. Um, really, we're here to share and interact around core ideas that have been the basis for a lifelong uh, set of foundational contributions to education, to psychology, to um, a lot of the, 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 the fundamental aspects of what we think about and what we uh, interact with on a daily basis. Uh, we have the privilege of inviting legends to the speak, speaker series, um, giving you direct access to ask them questions, be kind, of course, but uh, directly ask questions um, and be able to understand and maybe pose some of your own perspectives in terms of what the ideas are that we're sharing here. Um, I don't want to take up too much time because today we have an incredible uh, guest speaker, Dr. Vincent Tinto, which all of you know. Uh, he is the founder of the retention model, well known as Tinto's retention model. And if any, any of you have thought about how to retain students within the college uh, environment, which is something that I think we all have had at some point, then you probably have referred to aspects of uh, Dr. Tinto's work. Um, so without further ado, again, I welcome you to this conversation. Just a couple of things to remember. This is meant to be interactive. While we do sort of allocate the first 40 or so minutes, uh, giving Dr. Tinto some time to share with us an overview of his model and his work, a couple of questions by the panelists to follow up. Really, we're allocating a fair bit of time for you all to ask your questions. And one of the ways that you can do that most effectively is by posting your questions in the chat. One thing I'll remind you is that by default, the chat posts the questions only to the panelists. I would encourage you to change that to a panelist and attendee so that everyone can see the questions that you're asking. And again, we'll be scanning those, capturing those questions, and then making sure that Dr. Tinto has a chance to address them at, at the end. Without further ado, I cannot uh, tell you how grateful and excited I am again to be here with a legend, um, but I'll turn it over to Nicole to get us uh, get us introduced here. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're very excited, as Amit has mentioned, to welcome our guest, Dr. Vincent Tinto. Uh, Vincent holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and is currently a distinguished per, uh, university professor emeritus at Syracuse University. Uh, his recent work is focused on extensively on higher education with that specific focus, as Omid has mentioned, on student success and retention um, and the impact of learning communities on student growth and attainment, which has culminated in more than 50 published scholarly articles and chapters over his career. He has published two books as well. Um, the first, Leaving College, lays out the theory um, and policy perspective on student success that is considered the benchmark by which work on these issues are judged. And his second book, um, completing College lays out a framework for institutional action for student success and describes programs that are effective for promoting student success. And with that, I'd like to formally welcome Dr. Vincent Tinto. Vincent, thank you so much for joining us all today. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Amit. It's a pleasure to be here, folks. Um, let me start in order to describe uh, my so-called theory, which is not as a model. It's important to discuss the, I'll uh, describe to you the, the context in which it arose and the events which shaped how I think about that work. Because invariably folks, all our research, all our writing is invariably some form of autobiography. So let me start. Uh, when I was attending the University of Chicago uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, as I was finishing my doctoral studies, uh, the director of the office of planning, budget, and evaluation of the Office of Education, approached my advisor, Seattle Anderson, uh, to ask whether he had any graduate student who would be willing to write a small brief report for the office on what was then known as student dropout. And indeed, they would offer a small stipend to do so. My advisor approached me. Now, as any self-respecting graduate student would do, I accepted gladly, a stipend would help. <laughs> and and that, uh, 
that invitation was an opportunity that I otherwise would not have had. But in agreeing to write this report, I, I told the office that I would not simply summarize the research, but try to find a way of explaining it uh, that would make sense of why it explains what it does or does not. Uh, and that report formed the basis of my early writing, my 1973 article, and eventually the first book, and it's both editions. Uh, but my interest was not purely financial or uh, theoretical. My interest in the issue reflects the fact that I myself was a dropout. Years earlier, I dropped out of my doctoral studies in physics and left to join the Peace Corps. So that work meant something to me. At the same time, I was very fortunate to be part of an advanced graduate seminar at the University of Chicago that included another fellow graduate student, Bill Spady, who was then presenting in the seminar his ideas about how to use Durkheim's theory of suicide to think about student persistence. Immediately, it came to me that that was a useful way that I should write my work. So my work relies heavily on Bill Spady's work. It didn't come out of the thin air. It came full cloth from other, other people's work, but it involves a significant extension and modification of his work in two ways. It stresses the critical importance of communities and their character and how it affects students' willingness to persist. Second, it is aimed not at simply being theoretical, but of using that model of theory to ask questions about institutional practice. So first, why community? Well, that has something to do with my background. I grew up in a low-income immigrant community in New York City, and you know that's the case by my New York accent. Uh, uh, and given the quality of the local schools in the community, I commuted to a high school in Brooklyn, New York, uh, on the subways of New York City, which, has, uh, which is an experience of its own, for two and to three hours a day, every day for four years to do so. Then when I went to college, in this case in the Bronx, New York, I also had a commute every day for four years, two to two and a half to three hours a day, depending on the suburbs. For me, there was no such thing as a campus community. There were none. I didn't have time for any. And I think a lot of people who were themselves commuting students would understand that issue. So I strongly felt the need to have a community. It was my great fortune after having dropped out from, the, uh, from physics years earlier, that I joined the Peace Corps. There, I met a community where I cared for and cared for me. We shared similar values, similar commitments, and it was, I should say, it was just for me, very meaningful and important. Then it was also my great fortune to go to the University of Chicago that had a program for people who like myself worked and served overseas. Again, I found a community of people who shared common values, shared common interests, to which I felt a sense of belonging and mattering. That experience, a personal experience, tells me why communities matter. I don't need more research to prove that. I know that. Now, my interest in policy and practice also reflected my experience in the 60s and 70s and that of many other people. At that time, we were very aware that the, the way of describing poverty and inequality, and in my case, dropout, was to blame the victim. I think you know the song. Students can't stay because. You can fill in the blanks. And we saw that as blaming the victim and removing the light upon the role of the institution or the system, if you will, in shaping the dropout of its own students. So my concern was showing how we can use this model to show how the institution's actions affects the dropout of its own students. 
especially those of low income and minority status. And that is why my model in many parts is the way it is. So with that, let me try to then explain the model for those who may not know it. It starts with the assumption or the preposition that people come into the university or college with prior background experience, prior educational experience, and prior experience in the communities in which they live, the character of those communities and the character of the families from which they came. That in background is very important to understanding student persistence, but it's not something universities can do something about. It's a given and an important given. So my concern is given that, what is it that the university can do to reasonably affect the persistence of their students given their characteristics? And that is what the model seeks to do. It describes how students enter with given already commitments or goals, if they knew what they were, and interact with the university immediately, college, university, both the academic and social systems, both their formal characteristics, classrooms and student organizations, and their informal characteristics. That recurs with faculty in classrooms, faculty out of classrooms, students in learning, and social systems that are informed. Their experiences in those communities, multiple types of communities. Now, let me stress, uh, there is no one community. There are many communities in universities. Universities are very made up of many communities of different characteristics. Nevertheless, the model posits that the student needs to find some community in which they become, quote, integrated. Now, let me modify that term. In today's language, it become included. We don't use the term integrated because integrated then when the language was used was simply a place marker to describe the opposite of segregation, which in the 60s and 70s was a critical issue that we were all concerned about. So the question is how do their experiences shape their inclusion in those communities? And being included in the communities, the model argues that students come to become committed to the institution and to the members of the institution. And that commitment expresses a willingness to stay and persist. All right. But that's basically the elements of the model. Now, what, what matters in the model, of course, is the role of communities and the role of uh, the institution. And therefore the model sought to explain or treats describe some of the things that universities can do to increase inclusion. Um, and therefore, out of that evolved my interest with the classroom and the role of learning communities. As for the classroom, you know, at least anyone forget, most students commute. Most students don't live on residences, right? And many institutions are not residential. And of those who commute, many work full time, right? Many have other responsibilities. They have family, they have children, they have jobs. So you follow what those people do when they come to campus. If you literally could look at them and see what they do, they come to class, go to class, and when class is over, where do they go? They leave. They go to work, attend to their family, attend to their children. So in effect, the only place on campus where many, many commuting students spend is the classroom. And if we think of inclusion and engagement as mattering, it must matter primarily in the classrooms of the university. So I think of classrooms as their own separate communities. And we can ask the same questions of classrooms as we ask of the university generally. How do students' experiences in the communities of the classroom shape their sense of inclusion and therefore their commitment to the classroom and to learning. Now, by extension, that places the spotlight on who is particularly important to student persistence, the faculty. Yet it's always been a concern that too many faculty see the issue of student persistence as student affairs job. What's well, not my job? I only teach. Now, teaching is important, but if the classroom is the only place 
that many students spend on campus, your responsibility is so much more. And that's why a lot of my work is focused on the classroom as communities. Um, I think that's, in a sense, the basic character of my model. Uh, I don't want to spend more, much more time on it. I want to have spend more time with the questions that I know Omid has of me, but also to give you in the audience a chance to ask, ask as many questions as you wish. Uh, let me say that that model has now evolved, and I think Omid will ask you to talk about that. Because one of the characteristics of this model is that it looks at the issue through the lens of the university that has given my emphasis on university practice. The university asks the question, how do I retain more of my students? And that model seeks to reply to that question. But there's another question that evolves that it came to me later as we talk about the change of my work. So thank you. No, thank you. Uh, that was both a uh, very pointed, but also comprehensive summary of uh, a lifetime of work. And really, I wish we had more time. I would easily carve out weeks, if not months, uh, just to dive into the details and the evolutions and the challenges and um, of your work. But I wonder if, as we're trying to scan quickly over the 50 or so years uh, that you've been thinking about this issue, um, what would you say have, have been one of the biggest or most surprising insights that have come to you along that journey? Well, to be honest, how much I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. I don't know about anyone else, but when I write something, what I worry about is not what I said, it's what I didn't say. Mm. When I look at what is known, what I worry about is not what I know, what I do not know. So I recognize the importance of having continually to learn. See, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from the late historian, Daniel Borstein, who was a historian at the University of Chicago when I was there who once said, education is learning what you did not even know you did not know. Mm. And there's a lot I didn't even know I did not know. And thankfully, with the many multiple voices of people doing work in the same area, of their different perspectives, different backgrounds, gradually I came to understand there's a lot of things that I never even considered that I needed to learn. And that reflects the evolution of my work. Uh, for instance, uh, one thing I am learning, and then obviously learned, I should have learned, is the process that leads individuals to leave is so much more complex than our models can show. Because remember, I mean, our models are social science, quote, theories that don't predict individual behavior. They, in fact, explain how certain attributes of people or situations account for the patterns of behavior of people on average. And when you look more deeply at the issue of persistence, I just, there's some things that I didn't consider that I'm considering now. For instance, uh, the effect of the character place of student networks and with whom they associate in those networks. I've been doing quite a bit of reading and this current writing I'm involved with, trying to show how the very character of the network itself, how close it is or how loose it is, the very place of the student in the network, whether they're central to the network or on the edge of the network, and the character of the individuals with whom they make individual contacts or friendship matter. There's a very large study called the Swiss Student Life Study that researchers in Europe have used. And one of the things they find, which someone has found here, which is not surprising, is that students are more likely to leave when their friends leave. And when their friends stay, they're more likely to stay. Now that raises the interesting question on me. Can universities use the construction of networks intentionally designed? to change the pattern of the network and with whom students associate. For instance, an issue that concerns me and many others, can you construct a first year program like a learning community, for instance, 
that influences the long-term friendships between people that otherwise would not join of different races, different cultural backgrounds and different perspectives to cross the divides that now separate too many of our students and ourselves. So the, the Swiss study that I referred to only talked about the effect of a two week, two day program during orientation on those networks and discovered there was some change. Can you imagine what it would be like if you constructed an intentionally diverse and inclusive learning community for the first semester or indeed the first year? What might it be? And some of those learning communities are residential, they're called living learning communities. What, we, what could we learn, Omid, if we studied how they shape subsequent friendships and how those friendships change the pattern of relationships across groups and how they change the likelihood of persistence? So that's one of the things that I'm now exploring that I just recently learned about. And there's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder, and, and you alluded to this earlier, your models are fantastic, especially as um, an administrator or faculty member is trying to understand how they can influence the contextual factors that fosters a sense of connection that, that is conducive to students connecting with each other and academically. Um, and you also have mentioned in, in our past conversations and through some of your more recent work, the role of the student's subjective experience uh, uh, that interacts with how architecturally uh, you can create these contexts. And I, I wonder if you can speak to that for a moment. Uh, uh, um, you know, now that I have changed, see, I mentioned that lens through which I looked at retention through the lens of the institution. Uh -huh. In the last several years, I've changed my lens. I've changed the perspective. This is informed by other people's work. It's not my idea, for sure. And I asked, what do we learn when we see the university through the eyes of students? How do they make sense of their experience? And why does it matter? It turns out when you do that, Omid, it isn't engagement per se that concerns them or affects them. It's the meanings they draw from those engagements, specifically about their belonging and mattering. And it's that perception that drives a response to the university. It's that perception that the university has to address. Interestingly, the things that matter most to them, the things that affect their meaning, that from which they draw meaning, are issues of their perceptions of their ability and other people's perception of their abilities, otherwise known as stereotype threat, their perceptions of mattering and belonging, and the perceptions of the relevance of their studies. Now, those three issues are also the foundation for the concept of student motivation. Simply put, when you take away all the fancy language of social theory, you come to the simple conclusions that students have to want to persist in order to do so. And of course, have the ability to do so. So it leads institution to ask a different question. Instead of asking the question, how can we retain our students? They should be asking the question, what can we do to lead students to want to persist? And do so for all students, not just some. How do we change the nature of the experience and the value laden context of that experience on campus? So they feel they belong and are valued. That's the issues I'm trying to explore. And it's not a simple issue. But I'm not the only one looking at those issues, I mean, it's a large community of people doing the same thing. I'm curious if you could expand on the role of what faculty can do in the classrooms, um, ah. because I was also a commuter student and worked full time when I was an undergraduate. Sure. And so the, the classroom was where you met other students, that's where the college experience went. It seems like sometimes the focus on belonging and inclusion on campuses is really focused on the outside, outside yep. the classroom. Yep. So how can, you know, what recommendations do you have to switch that focus internally into the classroom? What are those challenges to actually getting faculty to realize how large their role is in that belonging for students? Uh, very important question, Nicole. <laughs> you and I have similar experiences. Um, well, let me answer that by just using an analogy. When I work with faculty, uh, I try to make clear to them, their job is not just to teach the students. Their tasks to construct an environment in the classroom in which students want to learn 
and in which they teach. Too many faculty think just of the teaching. No, that's not the thing that drives willingness to learn. It's the context in which it occurs. So that's why we look at issues not like only learning communities, but things like use of cooperative learning strategies, problem-based or project-based learning, where students have to work together in some collaborative fashion to learn. And that's the way you construct an evolving classroom, which is the analog of a constructing an evolving campus, you see. And that's a hard thing to get across because that means the job of the faculty is much more complex. Teaching is one thing, and it's, well, I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's one thing. But constructing a classroom that addresses those typical barriers that divide students and divide them from the faculty is the important issue. It's the same thing for campus. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that focus on classroom and then bringing in pedagogy into that as well. well that's right. You know, the that's lecture right. method is very standard, but we know <laughs> that the active and engaged learning that really yeah. does create that sense of belonging and community within the classroom yeah. helps students improve their outcomes, helps close equity gaps, and helps construct that environment. So it's a win-win-win yeah. all around. So I love that feature of the model. Well, I mean, it's, it's not any new insight, great insight. It's just that you recognize it's the analog of what we talk about for campus. Yeah. Uh, but that's difficult because then it asks faculty to do a lot more. Uh, and, and that, given the way many universities expect faculty to publish, do research or get grants, uh, it's not surprising that many faculty say, I just can't, I don't have the time. Yeah. And therefore the university has to focus as much on their students as on themselves. That's an excellent point. Um, I'm curious of how, I think someone in the audience has also asked this question as well. You know, now that online learning is becoming increasingly common, especially over the past year, you know, what are some ways in which you've seen your model or can think of how your model applies to these online environments as opposed to, you know, the in-person environments? Because in a lot of ways, when everyone's physically around you, it's a much more natural environment to help build that sense of belonging, yeah, yeah. learning community. Well, I mean, let me be clear. This is not in a field which I claim expertise and a goal. Um, but it seems to me the same principles apply. Students have to feel they belong. Uh, they have to be motivated to continue learning. And they have to be able to interact with the students in the classroom where they belong. But it's not easy to do online. As Nicole, you know that, and most people know that. It's difficult work, and the pandemic has showed it. Uh, in part, that's a reflection of the nature of technology. We don't quite yet have the type of technology which will allow easily uh, the use of collaborative learning and problem-based learning techniques, especially when there's a broadband issue and the power of one's technology at home matters. Um, nor do we have necessarily the, the very demanding set of skills that a faculty member needs, that she needs, uh, to develop that sort of strategy online. It is a very difficult environment. Now, nevertheless, let me just say for myself personally, in the last decade of my teaching, I taught online as well. Uh, it was difficult, uh, but what I did learn. Now, I always, I use what's called hybrid learning techniques. I never taught a full class online. It was a combination of face-to-face -face in classrooms and several classes during the semester would be online. The thing I discovered about that that always intrigued me, which I never really followed up upon, is that there, you know, I'd watch some groups in the classroom as they work together. Some students would be very quiet and be unwilling to express themselves, even though it was required to do so. But when you get online, some of those students just change who they were. Where there were lamb in the classroom, there were lions online. And what I like about that technology it allows us to gain access to multiple voices we have, or multiple selves. And often classrooms are too constrained that way. You've, it's hard to do that. So that's my experience, but I would love to hear other people in the audience reflect upon that. Uh, but it is a very demanding field of work. And in any case, uh, since my view of perception, of persistence, is shared by a student's perception of their interactions. Uh, the online environment doesn't lead to that very easily. Whereas a face-to-face -face environment, a lot of meanings are conveyed through body language, 
subtle messages and pauses and glances, you don't get that online. And therefore it's hard to figure out online uh, where you belong. And yeah, we miss a lot of that social information in no. the online environment that we're so attuned to no. paying attention to. Uh, I, I feel like I should warn you, Vincent, uh, your language is increasingly sounding like a social psychologist. Uh, <laughs> you, may, you may be stepping into the dark side. Well, you know, interesting you say that on me because uh, let me be clear. My model is not a theory. There is no such thing as social science theory. Uh, no model can account for all behaviors all environments, all factors. Uh, and, but if I had to classify my work, it's obviously not political model, it's not an economic model. I'd say it's fairly, it's a social psychological model. Um, and yeah, that's a fair statement, I mean. Well, um, I do wanna address some of the questions that have been coming into through the chat. Uh, we have one question. Uh, from uh, Liz Rainey, who is one of our collaborators on the College Innovation Network, who asks, I'd like to hear more about the connections and distinctions between belonging and mattering. Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, let me just uh, describe the work of uh, Silvia Hurtado um, uh, and others who write about this. It's called the, of, the Ecology of Validation. Mm -hmm. What a number of people argue that it's not just a matter of feeling you belong in a classroom, but that your voice matters and is validated as having a meaningful contribution to the dialogue of learning. So belonging is not the same as mattering in the same way that tolerance of people's presence on campus is not inclusion. Let's see if I, get, let's see if I made my point clear. Belonging is a sense that there's somebody on campus or group to which you feel attached. But whether your presence matters on campus, especially in the dialogue of learning in the classroom is another question. Uh, especially the question, does my voice matter? Does it count as valid, equally valid as other points in the classroom? And there's a distinction, a subtle distinction, but it really makes a difference. For example, you can, feel you belong to a small group in a college or campus. People with similar views, similar backgrounds. But sometimes those groups feel as an outcast from the larger campus. Sometimes we use the word enclave to describe such small groups when sense feel threatened by a larger environment. I think the audience will know what I mean by that. Um, but that doesn't ensure that doesn't quite ensure the sort of persistence I'm referring to. It's so how that group and the members of that group matter to the dialogue of the campus. Their voices and the things they all give you are valid contributions to what the campus needs to know. I hope that I hope that explains it. Yeah, I think that makes it really clear. And I think I, I'm curious to hear more. Um, one of the audience members is asking uh, Chris Klein about how the model can change and adapt in the online environment. Because I imagine the general structure can be applied that you know, students have different experiences coming in. Um, you know, if they feel like they belong and matter in that institution, mm -hmm. that'll increase their commitment. But is there a difference in terms of how this retention model may look in an online environment, especially when typically the classroom um, mm -hmm. or the learning community is the main community of the online environment? So how can, how can we think through how that model looks in a fully online environment? My sense is that the principles that we described together today would apply to the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. And my concern is how do you construct those in a more difficult, constrained environment? Uh, but how the model itself will change is not something that I've been, uh, not something I've given any thought to, Nicole. Yeah, I would agree that principles sound like they would equally adapt or apply in that online environment, but the execution would look quite different. Because typically, you know, especially now, what is even more common in an online environment is this asynchronous uh -huh. environment with classes, which I find it a huge challenge for online learning to solve is how do we create a sense of belonging and community for students and build these learning communities when students are almost never together at the same time. Yeah, that, that's why 
Ms. Holt, I mean, obviously the Zoom technology uh, with certain constraints, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you construct, if you can use that in the classroom, you construct little discussion groups within the classroom. We'll come back together and discuss it. It's possible, mm -hmm. but it's more demanding and requires for each of the individuals access uh, to those programs and the technology which allow that cross-platform, cross-group conversation. Well, we're getting there. I think, I think the future, we're not going to go back to where we were before the pandemic, nor should we. But I think there will be more use, hopefully more uh, effective use of online learning in combination with face-to-face -face learning. I, I think pure face-to-face -face learning or pure uh, online learning is less effective than the hybrid model. And the hybrid model seems to be what a lot of students are looking for as we yes, move forward, are. especially with everyone having you know some yes, sort are. of online experience in this past year. Because the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction at the beginning of a course establishes a foundation upon which online learning can work. I agree. So typically, it takes a week, two weeks, three weeks of class face time to develop those sort of combination of face-to-face -face engagements that drives the online learning, in my view. Yeah, I agree with that. Even in the typical classroom setting, you know, the first day of class is so important to setting that community set up for the rest of the semester. So I agree just, with online learning. Yeah, you should be that just way. an observation. <laughs> if I had any advice to give to faculty, the first thing you should not do in a classroom is read the syllabus. <laughs> it's you not ever, a good start. <laughs> no, you ever hear what students will say about this? They say, uh oh, it's one of these courses. <laughs> so I've never read the syllabus on the first day of class. No. It's just never. And the first thing I do when they get into class, I have them form groups. I want to establish the expectation that this class is about you working together and I'm the moderator. Absolutely. I think that's a great piece of advice. One of the uh, one of the points that I iterate in a lot of my own work is to remind um, faculty and administrators that when we look at learning, learning is not this content mastery process. Uh -huh. In many ways, it actually is a social experience where you start to develop and incorporate new identities of competency as you engage and experiment with new content and new environments and new connections. Um, I love that you mentioned that the average student is not one that we prototypically think about, the person who lives on campus in a four-year degree, uh, but that there really is actually a, a much more common identity. And one of the questions by uh, our, our attendees is by Reshma, and I love this question, who poses the question, many of our learners are balancing huge family work and financial responsibilities as they engage in our coursework a pattern that is becoming increasingly true for students across the country. How would you recommend encouraging high and consistent academic motivation while remaining cognizant of not uh, invalidating competing priorities? Can I have a question I could answer, I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's, a, that's extremely difficult, right? The question is, um, there's no easy answer to that. There's no easy path, I mean, uh, it would be nice if there were. Uh, that is important why we see so much inequity in outcomes because those conditions are not randomly distributed in our society. Uh, I think that, it, let me tell you a brief uh, st quote story. Uh, a number of years ago, we did a, a national study of learning communities and collaborative learning strategies for low income students in both two and four year schools. And as part of that study, we did a wide ranging set of qualitative interviews and studies. Two things emerged. Uh, one student who was a single parent with three children in the house, she lived in Queens, not far from where I grew up in Queens. And she had a commute to the community college in New York City called LaGuardia Community College where this program existed. Um, and when we talked to her about that, she said, uh, in the classroom, we knew each other. We discussed everything from all the classes, because in the only community you share classes, that is a group of students take several classes together as a cohort, said, uh, for me, she said, 
This class is like a raft running the rapids of my life. And what she meant for that, and you see the image of that, the social support she gained from that involvement allowed her to manage the stress of all the things she had to do to keep the family alive. Uh, and so at one point, these students, most of us, but these students specifically, you need support. You need to find a way of feeling that you share this struggle with other people who understand the same experience. Uh, at the same time, one of the students uh, who was part of a, a very diverse, intentionally diverse learning community from different backgrounds, different races, different orientations, uh, talked uh, the following way about uh, his experience. He said, you know, in the class, uh, we, we talk to people of different races, different colors, different sizes, different everything. I'm trying to quote this, everything. Not only did you learn more, he said to us, you learned better. I, I interviewed the young man. I said, uh, oh, I'm not confused. What do you mean by learning better? He said, by learning better, I mean you hear the voices of other students whose voices you did not hear. For him, learning was not only motivating, but illuminating, because now he had access to the voices he did not hear. Or we might say, he didn't know, he didn't know. And I find that's a sort of environment where, which sort of motivates people to continue on. So I can't address the, you know, the very challenging environments many students face. I wish we could, and I hope the current president can. Um, but I can't ask what would be the conditions that would motivate them continue, to continue in this stressful condition. Yeah, and one of the things that you mentioned earlier that, that resonates with me as well is um, to really have a mechanism through which you're able to connect to that student's subjective experience. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I'm proud to say that our organization does really well is that we have these mechanisms and these services that allows us to have the student voice represented. And when we work with partners, uh, we put that at the forefront of the work that we do. I think that's fundamental. It's uh, incredibly important because as administrators, faculty and decision makers, we're trying to create these contacts that serve our students. Many times we don't take the time to actually ask the students themselves. And so I think I appreciate you saying that. Um, well, you know what, but let me just um, talk briefly about how I've seen some changes in higher education administration over the years. Uh -huh. Uh, one of our hopes of many people, not just myself, was that eventually the administrators would understand their own responsibilities, stop blaming the victim. Uh, but more importantly, as importantly, to stop asking the question just of how do we retain students, but ask themselves, how do we act? How do we change what we do to lead more students to want to say? But it's our responsibility to establish, as it is for faculty in the classroom, an environment for our students to lead them to want to learn and want to stay. And when institutions start asking that question, they highlight a number of issues they must address on campus. The cultural value-laden environment of the campus, the way campuses are stratified into different groups of different characteristics, the way we divide people, not just students, but our own faculty. In fact, it can be said that faculty are often more disconnected from each other than students are. You know, faculty live in little fiefdoms with their own little private armies, their moats and crocodiles. So we need to construct a learning community for both our students and ourselves <clears throat> and learn how do we act together <clears throat> to improve the persistence of more of our students who make them want to learn and want to persist. Now, thankfully, it is event slowly becoming clear to institutions and administrators that the issue is not in just increasing persistence, but reducing the inequities in persistence. And those long-term embedded features of the institution that lead to those or reinforce those inequities. And now I'm talking about I'm not talking about equality, but I'm talking about equity, which is different, as you know, Amit. So we're going to move to some more audience questions that we have. So this one's coming from Esme. 
Um, I see there's often a disconnect between students and instructors with virtually no face-to-face -face interaction. It seems often or too often to lead to more opportunity to feel misunderstood when issues arise. I often see this when within my own role as a coach. Do you think this can be best addressed so that, or how do you think this can be best addressed so that students don't feel the urge to shut down and stop participating and engaging? Well, I mean, it, I wish there was an easy answer to that. <laughs> because students' perceptions of an environment reflect their own past experiences. And it's not always clear what students perceive the environment is what the intention of the person in the environment was in acting. So there's always a, sometimes a disconnect between what the students perceives and what the person carrying out that action intends in their action. Uh, and they're not always the same. And I think that's a basic human problem, of course. Because uh, remember, we, we act upon what we think is real, not what is real. Uh, so I think that's just a very difficult question, and, and I wish I had an answer, except I think it's important for people to be explicit about why they do what they do. So at least we lead students to understand what is it that leads us to act that way, uh, because I would think those actions are what we believe to be your interest, uh, but often we don't do that. We just leave it to chance. Yeah. And potentially those first interactions that you mentioned about setting the expectations and the tone for that learning community can certainly Absolutely. help The very with that. first expectation set the, the ball in motion. <laughs> That's why the first class is so important for faculty. You stop and set expectations about what this class is about. So in my first class, not only do I have group work, I have diverse, intentionally random assignment group work. I never let students... Most often, I do not let students pick their own group. Why? You know the answer. What did you do if you, as a faculty member said to you, Nicole, uh, uh, pick some students out to which you want to work with? Who would you pick out? Who's ever sitting right next to you, which is probably some of your friends. Know. Or your friends. <laughs> yeah. And that typically leads to re stratification along the same lines that now stratify us. So I have an intention of that first class to show that this is going to be a diverse, inclusive across lines. First impressions matter greatly. In fact, some of it comes from even admission standards, orientation programs, all those things matter. Yeah, I love that. Um, and uh, one other, you know, we promised our audience members that they could come with some really hard questions and they're certainly delivering. Um, you, you didn't know this, but that was what our advertising suggested. So here's another really great one. You didn't tell me this, Omid. I thought you were yeah, asked easy questions. <laughs> But I knew you could handle it. So uh, connected to the previous question that uh, Liz Rainey asked, um, uh, from what I've gathered reading from your work, the role of finances is a place where your thinking has evolved. And certainly as the cost of college has soared, where do you now see the role of finances and perceived value of the investment in college? Well, let me uh, speak to the, the last part of that question, perceived value. Mm -hmm. Uh, though I mentioned the notion of perceptions of the curriculum. Uh, let me speak a bit about that. There is a cost-benefit equation. I was trained in some economics. My other advisor at Chicago, Mary Jean Bowman, was the first woman to earn a doctorate in economics from Harvard. And we had to take a required course in economics of education. And part of it was the notion of cost-benefit analysis. Students have perceived some realistic sense of a benefit to endure the cost of acquiring that benefit. That doesn't say much other than what is we already know. But what they perceive as a benefit depends on what they perceive as a relevance of the studies that issue, to issues that matter to them. And too often, uh, especially in the first year, uh, faculty don't make explicit why their coursework matters. Think of the general first year courses. You know, you, you take a course and you have no idea why this matters to you. Or if you see the, the quality of the coursework, the quality of the instruction or the quality of the curriculum is of low quality, you question its, its value. So the more students perceive their work as relevant to the things that matter to them, the more they perceive that instruction and curriculum as of high quality and demanding the more I believe they'll perceive 
the value in gaining that knowledge and willing to bear the cost of doing so. For example, the analog of this is pretty clear. Students who have a positive experience on campus, who feel they're involved and included, sometimes are forced to leave by issues that pull them away, right? Uh, family, emergency issues, financial emergencies. But invariably, those students who have positive experience on campus are much more likely to return after those conditions are resolved or diminish because they, they see that the benefits of doing so outweighs the cost of continuing. But unless we make explicit that and think of how we make curriculum more relevant to students, it's a challenge. Now, for me, relevance is not about lecturing. It's about using the knowledge you have for a meaningful problem. So I'm a strong advocate of problem-based or project-based learning, which requires students to work together to use the material to issues that concern them. And once they do that, they start seeing things in ways they didn't see before. And at the same time, they develop critical thinking skills. Not trivial. I hope that's a reasonable answer to the question. Um, but of course, there's some financial constraints that just limit what students can do. Time on campus, time studying, dealing with children at home. Uh, there's obviously real cost a debate now about um, additional financial aid. For example, I am a strong advocate of the Pell Grants. I worked with Pell before. I think we have to increase those Pell Grants significantly. Um, and I think we have to make sure they continue over the summer. Because we know over the summer, there's such a continuing issue as summer melt or summer fadeaway, depending on how you call it. Uh, and you learn that what matters for many low-income students is not just participation, but continuous participation of all the year. In any case, that's, that's a different topic I'll need. Uh, and I wish we had more time. I'm gonna try to squeeze in one last question, uh, being respectful of everybody's time. Uh, and that has, to, that has to do with faculty. And you've mentioned the classroom being the central part of how we can build community and connection. I know that faculty are doing their best for the most- Yes, they are. Um, yes. And they have competing demands, and sometimes they don't have the training or the experience or exposure uh -huh. to be able to experiment and innovate. Uh -huh. um, you've already mentioned uh, some really wonderful recommendations in terms of simple things that faculty can do. Can you maybe just speak a little bit about yeah. the faculty's yeah. role and, and strategies that they can take? Yeah. Let me just state clearly something I didn't say. I well know there's many extraordinarily talented faculty who care deeply about their work, who understand the need to construct learning environments. That's not what I'm trying to say. For me, the issue is that <clears throat> when you look at people who teach, teach students in schools, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, it's striking that all of them are required to be trained <clears throat> and be certified to teach. Higher education is the only field in education that we as a faculty are not trained. Now that's not the fault of the faculty. The fact is we don't provide nor institutions provide a way of helping faculty acquire the skills they need to construct the sort of classrooms that they would build that would produce some learning outcomes. Now this is all beyond the notion of do they have time? Do they have support? Do they get rewarded for their teaching? All, all that is clear. But we have responsibility to help prepare our future faculty to do the job they've been asked to do. And we don't do that. So I'm not blaming the victim here. Again, I'm blaming putting light on the system that expects and demands of faculty something they're not being trained or provided resources to do. Now, of course, institutions are changing. And increasing institutions are recognizing this and trying to do what they can. But in my view, often those programs are voluntary. You know, they offer voluntary teaching programs. I'd say it should be required and not voluntary. If we require that for our high school teachers, why don't we not require it for our university teachers? But simple to say, difficult to do. I am a child of a low-income immigrant family 
-hmm. My father was a waiter his whole life. My mother stayed at home and sewed for some extra money. I still identify myself as a low-income kid. I'm still a kid from Queens, New York. I'll always be that person, no need. I think we're all here excited to be able to learn and apply what we've heard today. And, and again, as a, as a result of the con contributions that you've had and for being here today, this uh, speaker series um, is privileged to have individuals like yourself come and share with us both their personal experiences um, uh, as well as their, their academic and intellectual contributions that have shaped all of our lives. This is a series that we're thrilled to be able to continue. <clears throat> we have a conversation that we just recorded with uh, uh, Jane Elliott last week that we'll, make, we'll be making available um, in the coming weeks. We have another one uh, session coming up uh, in a couple of weeks on June 25th <clears throat> with Sandra Oliveri in terms of the impact of that tech and how that can help to enhance education and learning. Um, and really for uh, just this continued space that we have to, for all of us and all of you who are engaged and participating to interact and contribute to the work that we're all part of. And I really value hearing your voices and learning from you because I think we all on this together, folks. It's not just me, it's all of us who are concerned with these issues. And if my work has been helpful, I am pleased. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And, and again, uh, thank you for everyone for being here. If you have questions or want to reach out to our group, um, we're on all the social platforms. Our uh, Learning Lab speaker series will also be posted on our uh, YouTube channel. And all of those are at uh, WGU Labs. Um, so feel free to connect and stay connected. Um, again, thank you all for your time and, and your uh, contributions to making this a uh, reality and, and growing in, in our visibility. So um, have a great day and we'll, we'll speak with you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.